Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Evolution of Substance Abuse in the Workplace. My name is Courtney Woods. I'm the Sales Development Specialist at AccuSource, and I will be your moderator today. Today's presentation will last approximately 45 minutes with a 15-minute Q&A session to follow. Please submit any questions you have via the chat function of the GoToWebinar software. We will answer as many questions as we have time for live. However, if time does not permit, we will answer questions on an individual basis post-webinar. A copy of this presentation will be available within 24 hours. If you would like a copy of the recorded presentation, please contact us at marketing at accusors-online.com and we'll be happy to provide that to you. As we get started, I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Cynthia Woods, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at AccuSource. Cynthia has, over, has more than 20 years of experience in sales and marketing with over 14 years in the employment screening and human resource service industries. Through her tenure, she has assisted large and small businesses, including several 14 Fortune 500 enterprises in achieving their quality staff acquisition and risk mitigation goals by aiding them in selecting the right mix of background and drug screening products and services to meet their unique business needs. Cynthia holds both Bachelor of Science in Business Management and a Master's of Business Administration degrees. She is a long member of the Society for Human Resource Management and an active participant in the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. So now I will turn it over to you, Cynthia. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join our presentation today. Um, today's presentation will be on the evolution of substance abuse in the workplace. Apologize for that. Good. Mouse got stuck there for a moment. Um, so before we get started, I do want to share a legal disclaimer with you. The content provided in this presentation is for informational purposes only. It should not be construed as legal advice or serve as specific guidance. AccuSource strongly encourages current and prospective clients to seek the advice of qualified counsel, preferably specializing in employment law, prior to engaging in any legal decisions involving drug and or background screening policies or compliance concerns. So now that we have our, our legal disclaimer out of the way, um, I'd like to quickly go over our agenda for today. Today we're going to discuss the evolution of drug abuse in the United States and worldwide. We'll discuss um, how the standard five panel stacks up against current high abuse drugs and why that the five panel drug screen may not be the perfect fit. We will also discuss um, the new, new and improved options in drug testing, including oil swab testing and also including um, hair testing. We will also and then discuss the, uh, the legalization of marijuana and capacity use statutes and how the state legislation um, and the federal legislation is impacting companies' best practice policies. So first, the evolution of drug abuse. I apologize. I'm having a little bit of a technical issue here with the with the web with the uh, presentation software. Um, so first, I'd like to go ahead and discuss um, some historical facts about drug abuse. Opioid abuse, um, especially in the form of morphine, became became very prevalent with soldiers um, that were injured in the American Civil War. This has led to uh, opiate abuse being originally nicknamed the soldier's disease. 
1935, this, um, this abuse became so prevalent, the, that and the abuse of alcohol, that Dr. Bob Smith and Bill Wilson, sometimes known as Bill W, Bill w started Alcoholics Anonymous. Later, um, Kenny Kennan, or sorry, Jimmy Kennan also started Narcotics Anonymous because we'd already reached a point in the United States in the middle of the last century where there were several American or numerous Americans were suffering from both drug and alcohol abuse disorders. In the 1970s, phencyclidine, also known as PCP and angel dust, bypassed um, LSD as one of the number one drugs of abuse and also the number one hallucinogenic drug used by Americans. In the 1980s, cocaine became the drug of choice and many Americans became, abuse, became addicted to crack cocaine because it was highly addictive, easy to obtain, and inexpensive. Additionally, thought to be safer than, than, than the speed that was currently out on the streets, many young people be, began using ecstasy because it was legal until 1985. All of this abuse led to Nancy Reagan making um, drug abuse her main platform campaign during her tenure as First Lady when she implemented the Just Say No campaign on September 14, 1986. Drug abuse had, in the United States had reached such a high level that in 1991, in an effort to try to protect Americans while traveling. The Omnibus Transportation Act of 1991 was formed and provided the initial framework for the DOT drug testing that we see today. From 1991 to 2008, the sale, uh, the sale use and death rate for opioid prescription pain relievers rose by almost 400 percent. Now a lot of you are probably thinking why, you know, painkillers have been out there for a long time. Why was there such a significant rise from 1999 to 2008? That's part of the reason why I started this presentation with talking about the soldier's disease because from 1999 to 2008 we had numerous soldiers coming back from both the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And this, these wounded soldiers coming back into the states was one of the primary reasons why opioid prescription pain relievers rose by so much in, in, in that time period. Additionally, as doctors were prescribing more and more painkillers to our wounded soldiers, they were also providing more and more painkillers to other people who were seeking pain relief who then unfortunately became addicted to the substance. This led to over, over 20,101 overdose deaths related to prescription painkillers, 12,990 overdose deaths related to heroin, as many painkiller um, and opioid substance abuse, member, abuse people or, or citizens who are afflicted with these disorders then turn to heroin as their next drug of choice when they can no longer get prescription drugs. So altogether, there was 52,404 deaths in 2015 related to accidental drug overdose, leading to make this the, the, making this the leading cause of death in the United States for that year. An estimated 70% of the 14.8 million Americans who use Ill illegal drugs are employed which, is caught, which now costs businesses in excess of $81 billion annually. And the reason why I went through this entire history lesson is to basically illustrate that drug abuse in, in the United States isn't going away. And just saying no isn't simply enough. There is such an epidemic with drug abuse in the United States that every single time we as a society find a way to try to help curb and address this abuse. The people who are abusing drugs find another drug form which then becomes the next wave of abuse. And so that leaves employers asking, you know, how should I test? Who should I test? 
where should I test, and all other different kinds of questions to try to minimize the, um, the effects of substance abuse in the workplace. So some of the questions employers should ask is, what illicit substances should be included in our organization standard screen? And do the employee populations that we, we employ, do they, do they pose any special risk given our line of business? They should also ask what test methods are the best option for our individual business objectives and our individual business culture? Because not all, court, well, not all cultures fit all methods of testing. Further, they should ask what zero tolerance really means. Do I understand the difference between state and federal legislation affecting drug use? And are we partnered with a drug screening provider who supports our company's individual needs? Because again, not all businesses are alike, and so therefore not all businesses should have exactly the same drug testing program. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about challenging the standard five panel. The standard five panel lab-based drug screen has been the gold standard in the United States for more than 20 years. The substances that are included in this five panel drug screen are marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, which also includes methamphetamines, opiates, which includes codeine, and phencyclidine or PCP. And as we discussed earlier, PCP is the, is the hallucinogenic that became very popular in the 70s. Based upon, the, based upon SAMHSA and the Department of Transportation guidelines, these, these, these different substances are considered to be the most commonly abused substances by employers. However, given the evolution of drug abuse in the United States over the last 20 years, I would like to challenge that testing for these five substances alone, or even some of the substances testing for them at all is not enough, and that certain changes likely need to be made to ensure employers are protected. So DOT evolution. So the five panel drug screen basically became the, 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 the panel of choice based upon the fact that the DOT established those five panel those five drugs as being the primary drugs of abuse and the ones that they would include in their testing all the way back in the early 1990s. So um, even the DOT has recognized that these five drugs alone are not enough to protect Americans who are traveling our highways, airlines, ships, et cetera, um, from being injured by impaired employees. So the DOT revised the five panel drug screen on October 1st, 2010 to include expanded opiates, heroin and morphine, um, to answer the incredible rise in heroin and opioid abuse that has occurred through the early 2000s. And they also, um, provided an expanded panel to the amphetamine and methamphetamine panel to include um, spe specific testing for MDMA or ecstasy. Because again, ecstasy, um, once it became, once it was designated as illegal in the 1980s, the actual use of that particular drug has risen significantly in the United States since. Further, the DOT on January the 23rd, 2017, along with the Department of Health and Human Services, both published documents indicating the DHS and DAT's intent to further expand opiate panel, um, the opiate panel to include additional Schedule II opioids of hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. This expanded panel has not quite gone into effect yet, and we're still waiting for information from the DOT on when the specific date will, will actually take place. However, the Department of Health and Human Services, when um, changes went into effect on October 1st, 2017, 
and the effect uh, this actually changes the um, guidelines for federal workplace urine drug screening programs. So if the federal government has already recognized that the standard five panel misses the mark, why are employees still using it as the gold standard? Misinformed, um, so some of the reasons why this is occurring is because empl is employers are simply misinformed. Their current vendor has not provided current decision-making data, and so they have a belief that utilizing, um, utilizing the five-panel urine-based drug screen is still the best option that's available to them today, and so they continue to use the product that they've used for years. Many of them also have some pricing concerns. They feel that if they increase the panels that they're testing for or change those panels, that all of a sudden their drug testing programs will become cost prohibitive and they will not be able to maintain them. Um, additionally, there is some fear that leadership um, may, be slow, may be slow to change and that you know there's, there's so many other things that businesses need to worry about that until something really bad happens, leaders of companies often put off changing drug screening because at the time it's just simply not the squeaky wheel. And finally, there's complacency. Um, the companies have had the same substance, substance abuse policy for sometimes 5, 10, 15 years or more. And again, since you know it simply isn't a priority to change it, at least that's their belief until something really bad happens and they realize how much money they're actually losing by not reviewing that substance abuse policy. And just a reminder, the cost of workplace abuse is greater than 80 billion in the United States. So it begs the question, why not evaluate your current program? So some suggested practices are to review the substance abuse policy annually along with employment background um, screening, your, along with your employment background screening policy and to use a trusted source for legislative updates, um, a qualified TPA or drug screening provider should be able to provide an organization with regular updates on an annual basis or as they come out through the regular means of providing support to their clients. You should also consider, we also suggest that employers consider their own unique workforce. Um, just because, you know, your next door neighbor's company you know, finds a certain program that works for them doesn't necessarily mean that your company is going to have the same needs. Um, they should consider if there's any special risk of exposure due to um, due to employees having access to pharmaceuticals and healthcare industry, or having a high percentage of manual labor and which is prone to injury, or if they are dealing with employees that are rather transient and have frequent job changes. Such as, um, such as contract or contingent labor. All of these special classes provide additional risk to organizations. Organizations should also evaluate key risk identifiers. Um, some of those are if you notice that there's an increase in your workers' comp claims or you're noticing an increase um, in preventable accidents, both of these could be red flags that there is an issue with substance abuse within the organization. Additionally, um, almost all employers should consider changing their panels or increasing their panels to include um, expanded opiates as the price difference to include the substance is usually really minimal and the benefit of, um, the benefit of testing is, is usually fairly great to the organization as the percentage of people who actually go to work and um, try to carry out their day on prescription painkillers is quite high. Um, and finally, uh, employers should also consider the possibility of using the DOT testing standard for both their non-DOT and DOT regulated workers. There's a couple of benefits to this. It truly does um, provide organizations with a zero tolerance um, you know, baseline for their workers because everyone is being treated equally. Additionally, the with the new recommendations from the DOT and the Department of Health and Human Services, um, the DOT drug screen as um, as projected is actually a very solid drug screen that covers the employers quite well as far as testing for um, common drugs of abuse.
So why are we still defaulting to urine-based drug screening? So the DOT drug test is obviously, um, by, by its very definition, a urine-based drug test. But all employers are not required to do urine-based drug screening. Yet it appears that all employers, or at least the very uh, high predominant employers today, still believe that the urine-based drug test is the best and only um, you know, one of the only means that they should be testing for um, illicit substances at work. The, the Department of, uh, of Health and Human Services Scientific and um, Technical Guidelines published on um, April 11, 1988, required that laboratory testing and um, laboratory confirmation testing um, be mandated for all substance abuse testing. And the DOT CFR 49 Part 40 requires all drug tests um, are split specimen, um, that, they're, that they're processed out of SAMHSA certified laboratory, um, that they are confirmed with GCMS confirmation, and that a medical review officer reviews each result. And many um, employers just simply believe that, you know, they, they need to follow those guidelines um, for a drug screening program to be effective. Um, Unfortunately, that's not always the case. So there are some other common methods of substance abuse testing that employers should consider in determining if the program that they're offering is the best option. Um, obviously, there is the, the urine-based lab test. And some of the benefits of that test are that it is the recognized standard. It is closed to scrutiny. In other words, it's held up in court many times. And it's very easy to confirm the results with GCMS testing. Um, the, some of the challenges to the urine-based drug test is it can be quite costly, um, especially if it is a rural employer or someone who's not close to um, collection facilities that are easy for the applicants to or employees to um, go out to. Um, it can be really um, costly for employers because they have to use third-party facilities. Um, it also can be very inconvenient for the test um, subjects as they often have to take time out of their day to actually go test. And there are a lot of negative so, um, social um, impacts to doing this type of testing. In other words, sometimes employers avoid testing altogether because their only reference point is urine-based drug testing, and they feel like it will, um, you know, kind of drive a wedge between them and their employees. In other words, it won't be socially acceptable am amongst their, um, you know, their staff groups. So um, another option is urine instant drug testing, which has the benefit of being expense, inexpensive and having quick results because the employer is actually testing on site. However, it does require special bathroom facilities, and then there is what we like to call the ick factor for staff. In other words, a lot of staff members, unless they're a registered nurse or um, another person who is hired specifically for drug testing, um, are adverse to, you know, obviously collecting some, someone's urine and then, then testing it. Um, there is another option, which is the urine um, instant clinic-based drug test. So um, instead of a specimen being collected and the um, applicant, and then that specimen then being sent um, over to the laboratory for testing, the specimen is actually collected at the clinic, and then the clinic utilizing, um, you know, a special uh, specimen reader will uh, test the the specimen right there on site and then go ahead and deliver the results directly to the employer. Um, usually this is this is fairly um, quick, usually within an hour or so of the, of the applicant or employee testing, the results are then shared with the employer. Um, however, it can be um, kind of, it can be quite costly to do this type of testing um, and there also are limited clinic options because you have to utilize a clinic that um, has the specialized equipment and can provide that testing on site. So a lot of employers are now looking at um, oral swab testing as an alternative option to the urine drug test for many reasons. It seems to be a little more socially acceptable and accepted by employees. Um, there's, there's less of that factor of um, being invasive. 
Um, even though a lot of people would argue that you're, you know, providing a urine sample is not invasive, some employees do see it that way. And obviously, an oral swab test um, is more, you know, is more comfortable for employees. Um, there's there's two different options for the oral swab test. One of them is um, to basically uh, collect the specimen and then it's shipped to the uh, lab and tested at a lab facility. So therefore, it is tested in a controlled environment. Um, some of the challenges to that is, um, so obviously it's quite convenient, um, but some of the challenges to that are um, that, there it, that it can be somewhat cost prohibitive. It's a little bit more expensive than an actual urine-based drug screen. Um, it does take a little bit of additional processing time and um, when it comes to marijuana and THC, there's a limited window of detection. Um, the other option that's, that's currently available is the instant oral swab. We actually see a lot more employers going this direction. Um, it is um, because the devices have improved greatly and there's even some devices today that have FDA approval. Um, the cost, it, you know, some of the benefits are obviously the low cost. Um, that there's no, it's an on-site collection option, but you don't have to have same-sex collectors or specialized bathrooms to be able to execute the test. Um, there's also some challenges, which are, again, the, the window for detection for THC can be somewhat limited, and also um, there is a limited ability to do confirmation testing. Most devices can be shipped to um, to a lab for secondary testing. However, um, that that secondary testing can be a little costly. However, if you balance that with um, the, the low cost of, of the specimens, I mean of the um, collection kits to begin with, then it can actually be a you know a fairly cost effective option. Um, but there are some states that regulate usage, usage of it um, and may even prohibit the use of oral swab testing. And then lastly, there is hair testing, which has been around for a very long time. Um, the, the, the chief benefit of hair testing is the long detection window. Um, those detection windows can be upwards of three months. You know, provided that they're you know that they're able to get the entire follicle, and um, that um, and that they're able to get a substantial you know amount of hair to be able to test an actual history. Um, the the some of the challenges are that the cost is can be quite prohibitive. It's usually two to three times the cost of a standard um, urine-based drug screen, um, and there is uh, some negative social. Um, social impact and that employees feel that actually cutting their hair is quite invasive and it's often only reserved for certain um, certain types of industry like gaming um, and um, and certain healthcare industries where they're looking for long periods um, and histories of abuse. So um, the detection windows by substance so we talked a little bit on the previous slide about the different options that are out there. So I wanted to share with you the different um, detection windows for each, by each substance. Uh, THC is actually detectable in urine for three days for you know a one-time user or a, a very sporadic user, and um, up to 30 days for chronic users. Um, the average there is probably about 15 for chronic, but um, based on you know, body composition, it can actually stay in someone's system for 30 days or more on a urine and be detected on a urine-based drug screen. Um, in oral fluid testing, and that is you know, one of the concerns um, with oral fluid testing for marijuana use, is that um, in, for oral fluid, it pretty much detects um, very recent use, usually it's, um, the statistics show about 24 hours, but actually I've seen other statistics that show as low as like 12 hours, um, up to about 36 hours of detection. And then obviously for hair, it's up to 90 days. Um, amphetamines, the went for amphetamines, opiates, cocaine, um, and phencyclidine or PCP, the detection windows are very, very similar for um, an in the urine drug screen, we're looking at one to three days detection window, and for oral fluids, um, probably between 24 and 48 hours. So as you can see, for some of the other common drugs of abuse, um, the detection windows are um, 
are actually very, very similar for both the urine and the oral fluid testing. And obviously for hair testing, again, um, up to 90 days history. So some considerations. Um, employers should investigate and consider all organizational goals in selecting a drug testing method. Um, especially if you have special populations, you should consider um, options in varying the method of drug testing to specifically meet your population or varying the, the, the panels that are tested for, again, to meet your specific population, especially if you're in healthcare or, um, or in uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing industries, um, you're definitely gonna wanna up those panels to ensure that you're including prescription drugs to ensure that you do not have an issue with abuse of those. Um, On-site testing can provide um, additional options to employers seeking rapid cost-effective options for reasonable suspicion um, testing. Um, it also has, um, is, is gaining a lot of use for job fairs or high volume hiring, seasonal hiring, et cetera. Um, example, there's two big box stores that I can think of off the top of my head that both use the oral swab testing during the interviewing process. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a, kind of catches employees off guard a little bit because, you know, they may interview with one manager and then another, you know, another manager comes in and basically says, okay, great, well, you know, we like you and we'd like to have you interview with someone else, but before that, we're going to go ahead and do a, you know, an oral drug test. Do you have any objections? And um, there's been a lot of feedback that has indicated that um, a lot of employees um, do what I would like to call, you know, self-selection uh, or self-removal from the process. Um, if they are a drug user, they're used to having, you know, taking a urine-based drug test and, you know, basically utilizing, you know, some method of trying to mask the test or, you know, bringing urine in from outside or one of the other many, many ways that people try to break um, urine-based drug test and, um, and avoid, you know, kind of skate around the system. And with an oral swab test, they're tested right there in full view of the, um, of the tester. And so it's really hard for them to do that. So it can be a really effective method of drug testing, especially for, you know, very recent use. Um, also, you know, you, one last thing, you do want to make sure that you check your state and local laws before initiating any substance abuse program or making changes to your current programs as the, the laws in each state and municipality can vary greatly. Um, a good partner will always provide you with, um, with the current law in the jurisdictions that you're testing in. So the last section that I'd like to cover with you is what about legalized marijuana and compassionate use? Um, this has become a very hot topic in drug and background screening um, because um, obviously, you know, we went from a couple years ago with just one to two um, states with legalized marijuana to now eight states that have legalized marijuana and it's becoming a big question for employers of what do you do with employees who are possibly utilizing marijuana for recreational use in their off time, which is a legal, legal um, you know, is, is a legal right within their state, um, or they have employees who are in one of the 28 states or um, three territories that have legalized compassionate use laws who are use, utilizing it for a medical condition. So employees, employers are often challenged with trying to determine what they should do with those classes of employees. So states with current legislation are um, are listed on this list and they, um, and they include everything from Alaska to Guam and Puerto Rico. Um, and currently there are only 12 states in the United States that do not support um, compassionate use. And of the states that support compassionate use, there are an additional eight states, Alaska, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, who have further gone to legalize marijuana for recreational use and that um, have legalized it where um, persons may have small amounts for their own personal use on them um, and avoid prosecution for, um, for, for uh, drug use. So the effect of state legislation on employers. 
So there's employers are often confused about this, and it really has to do with going back to civics class and you know the whole balance of um, of state and federal government. And um, from those of you who it's been a few years since civics class, I'll give you a little reminder. Um, basically, a federal law generally trumps state law unless there's a compelling interest for the state law to supersede it. And in this case, there's a compelling interest for the federal law to supersede the state law. And so employers still can screen for marijuana in states with legalized recreational use um, as the federal courts have held, and it is a federal law that marijuana um, used for any reason is a federal crime. So um, if you have DOT employees, obviously DOT um, regulations supersede any state laws. But in addition to that, even for your general employees who are not in the safety sensitive role or not in some specialized class, um, the federal law supersedes the state law in regards to, um, to marijuana use. So yes, employers under federal law may still drug test pre-hire and um, deny employment based upon you know, a positive drug test should they so choose. Um, they also have the ability to use drug testing for reasonable suspicion or, um, or post-accident testing you know, as, as prescribed by their individual state um, and not run afoul with, with federal law. Um, it is highly suggested that employees are advised in their um, employer substance abuse policies that the company is a zero tolerance company and that zero tolerance means zero tolerance and so therefore the company follows federal law and will not um, you know uh, will not make exceptions for an employee um, who claims that they used marijuana off duty when federal law you know basically prohibits the use totally. Um, and many state, many employers have found that disclosure is a heavy deterrent to um, employees, you know, to situations where employers are losing good employees because they simply um, didn't understand um, how the employer would treat it or didn't understand that their job, you know, or their, you know, future employment might be in jeopardy by utilizing drugs, specifically marijuana. Um, there was a new ruling that came out in um, July of 2017 in Massachusetts. Um, the Massachusetts Superior Justice Court ruled that an employer um, did discriminate against an employee with Crohn's disease for terminating her employment um, for testing positive for marijuana. Um, and in their ruling, the um, Massachusetts Superior Justice Court cited protection under capacitive use, I can all but guarantee you that this particular case will end up, you know, being appealed, and that it will likely um, be one of the cases. And I'm sure there will there will be others that will follow soon, that will help, um, you know, that through the courts we'll begin to see um, basically the final ruling on whether compassionate use will or will not be allowed in the workplace. So I would definitely um, keep an eye on this because it's, it's going to be something that is going to be evolving over the next couple of years. And just like many of the changes that we've seen in drug in um, background screening uh, compliance and regulations, this is definitely going to be something that's going to be continuously evolving. So at this point, I would like to go ahead and take any questions that anyone might have. All right, Cynthia, we have a couple questions here. So the first one is, is how should I handle positive test results on an instant oral swab drug screen? So if you get a positive test result on an instant oral swab drug screen, um, if you are in one of the states that requires you to test the same specimen, and I believe there is just one of those, um, then you would uh, want to go ahead and send that specimen to the lab, that, that, that uh, oral saliva specimen to the lab, 
and the lab would then go ahead and test it and provide you with confirmation testing. However, what we see a lot of employers utilizing the um, instant oral swab products to do is to provide like a pre-screening. So um, basically what they'll do is they'll give, they'll give an, um, an applicant or an employee in the case of like a post-accident reasonable suspicion situation, a, um, an oral swab drug test, and then if it comes out as potentially positive, um, then they will go ahead and send the employee onto, you know, onto the um, collection facility to do an actual uh, urine-based drug screening, which can, can then be confirmed by um, GCMS confirmation and can then be reviewed by an MRO. Um, I do want to give you one caveat here. Uh, I always suggest to employers, if you have a situation where you have a reasonable suspicion post-accident drug screen, never let that employee drive to the, to the collection facility on their own or go to the collection facility on their own. Always provide transportation, even if that's simply calling them a cab. Fantastic. Um, so I have another question. We are in retail and have a lot of hourly staff members. We do not currently test due to the cost and the need to quickly onboard staff. Any suggestions as we head into our holiday hiring? Yes. Um, again, I would, I, I would highly suggest the utilization of the oral swab drug testing. Um, it is very, is becoming very popular in retail um, because of its low cost. Generally, employers can often, if they're buying in volume, can buy test, you know, lower than ten dollars a piece um, you know most of your your um, lab based drug screens are going to run you twenty five to thirty dollars or more depending on the panels um, the great thing about the oral swab drug test is they also have a lot of flexibility generally um, some of the better models you can actually um, you can actually choose up to 14 different panels and you have flexibility in choosing what those panels are so um, for example right now the positive test rate for PCP is less than one less than 0 0.0001 percent um, so obviously it's quite low I'll be honest I think I saw a PCP positive back in like 2005 and that's the last time I saw one so um, um, a lot of employers are swapping out that particular test panel and maybe swapping in something with a higher abuse rate like oxycodone or maybe even, um, you know, ecstasy. So you have a lot of flexibility there. So especially if you're hiring younger hires and you know that there's a lot of prescription drug use, drug abuse, and there's also a lot of, um, you know, like um, party drugs like ecstasy, that there's a high level of abuse there, then you can actually kind of shape that drug screen to meet your population. So that would be my suggestion, because you can test a lot of people really quickly and get them to work. Okay. Uh, is there any reason not to use oral swab testing? Um, again, there's a couple of, um, of states that have some, some um, restrictions. Uh, for example, um, uh, you know, Nevada is one uh, state that has some restrictions against oral swab testing. Um, there is also some restrictions in the Carolinas. Um, so I would check your individual state laws. Some states don't specifically prohibit it. They just indicate that if you if you utilize an oral swab or an oral fluid um, testing method, that that um, testing method must be able to be confirmed by lab-based confirmation, um, which is available. Um, uh, there in the state of Nevada, um, that they, they have more of an you know an exclusion on it, um, and so we you know we generally do not recommend that employers in the state of Nevada are actually utilizing oral-based drug testing. So that would be the only reason why. Okay, um, we test safety rate related positions only. On random tests, can we exclude high management from the pool? I would be very, very cautious of that. Um, at taste, okay, so perfect example, testing just safety sensitive in, in the state of California, um, you can, like for example, you can get away with that process. Um, however, that being said, um, excluding management from anything definitely puts the spotlight on you. Um, it, it, it creates uh, um, 
often a bad feeling among employees that management is, um, you know, kind of uh, held to le a lesser standard um, and has preferential treatment. Um, the best practice is always treat all your employees the same. Now, the caveat to that is obviously if you have safety sensitive employees and you're doing just DOT testing on them and you're not testing any other workers, that is that's probably okay. But if you're if they're not DOT regulated and you're just testing test, testing safety sensitive employees um, and you're excluding other workers, especially management, then you might have a little bit of a challenge. Awesome. Uh, why is there such a big window of variance in detecting marijuana in urine and saliva? So um, basically it has to do with how um, marijuana is metabolized or THC is metabolized. Um, THC basically, especially in, in habitual users, is, um, is basically this, the um, chemical compound basically um, becomes stored in our fat cells. And so, um, you know, I, don't, I guess about the easiest way I can put it is, is, you know, if you're someone who has a super high metabolism and very little body fat, then you're going to metabolize THC very fast. And if you're someone who has um, a higher, um, you know, uh, if you have a higher uh, body fat composition, then you're going to and not as fat high of a, a metabolism, you're going to metabolize it a lot slower. Um, since it stores in our fat cells, it's basically slowly released over time for a habitual user. And so, um, basically, um, when you're when they're doing an oral swab or oral saliva test, um, you know, it's that saliva isn't getting the THC that's released from the fat cells. It's, it doesn't carry over into saliva. However, it is eliminated through the body through um, our urine. And so that's why it's detectable longer in urine than it is in saliva. Okay. Um, we have a lot of older employees. Does this reduce our risks for workplace drug abuse? Um, no, actually it's, um, it, it, it can increase your risk. Um, they, statistics are showing that baby boomers are one of the fastest growing populations for drug abuse. Um, what happens a lot of times is baby boomers, as we get older, um, we start to, um, you know, have more sports injuries, more, you know, need for more surgeries and that type of thing. And so there's more of a situation where um, a doctor may prescribe prescription drug, uh, you know, prescription painkillers, um, you know, opiate-based prescription painkillers. And so what happens is, um, is older, we're, they're finding more and more that older Americans um, are becoming addicted to, um, to opioids. And, um, you know, whenever the, the medical condition that they originally started taking the medication for is over, they continue to use and abuse, and in some cases even cross over into heroin use. So um, just because you have a population of baby boomers or, you know, high level or, you know, higher year Gen Xers doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that you're at, at, at a lesser risk. All right. Um, when do the changes to the DOT mandated drug tests go into effect? So the DOT mandated, um, they actually have not released the exact uh, date yet. It was expected when, when the DOT released their, their documents back um, on January 23rd that it would likely go into effect on or, or about the same time the DHS um, regulations went into effect, um, which was October the 1st. But um, at, to date, the DOT has not released those new, um, you know, those new regulations yet. In other words, they haven't given an effective date for them yet. Um, I believe that there is still some commentary going on about them. Um, and so, um, again, that will be something to watch over the next few weeks and months because, um, you know, it is anticipated that they will, that those changes will go into effect um, fairly shortly. Um, I can I can say that um, the um, office of um, the office of management and budget uh, did make some changes to the federal chain of custody form, and that that occurred on August the eighth, um, two thousand and seventeen. So um, again, you know, 
it can be very confusing for employers because there's a lot of changes going on at one time. And so again, I would make sure that you're with a, you know, a very solid drug and background screening company um, that is helping you um, oversee your program to ensure that you're always kept abreast of any changes that are occurring and when those changes actually go into effect. And I can tell you for all AccuSource clients, we will continuously publish those updates so that our, our clients are informed. Fantastic. Um, can you repeat the answer about always driving someone to a clinic that was that only for post accident or was that if there was an in house inclusive test inconclusive test sorry. If you have an in house inconclusive test and you have any um, and you have any indication that that person, you know, appears to be under the influence at the time that you're testing, I would apply the same standard to put as post accident or um, reasonable suspicion. And I would go ahead and ensure that they have transportation to the collection facility. Um, the reason being is um, obviously if they are engaging in a work related activity with you as their employer, um, then uh, you could be held responsible if they then go and get in the vehicle to go drive to a testing facility and, and, and you know, an accident or someone is injured in the, you know, as a result of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you recommend that we add contractors to our random pool for testing? Yes, if you, um, so, we're getting into an area that, that that's a little bit specific to each organization um, and exactly what their makeup is. But if you have, um, if you are required to do um, random pool testing for DOT workers, and those contractors are in a safety sensitive slash DOT regulated position, then um, they do need to be part of your safety sensitive pool, whether they are your um, whether they do have to be part of your testing pool, whether or not they are your employees or whether they are contractors. Um, the, the Department of Transportation does not specify that it has to be an employee. It's anyone who is doing work for your organization who is, um, who is in a safety sensitive designated position. And that, that whether or not someone is safety sensitive is, is I'll just throw this out there to you, um, whether or not someone is safety sensitive is not defined by job title, it's actually defined by job duties. So you would, um, my suggestion would be that you contact your current provider of your, um, your drug testing, your current administrator of your um, safety sensitive program, um, and they can assist you in contacting drug abatement and getting a specific, um, a specific uh, ruling on who should be tested, or uh, I would, um, or I would definitely contact drug abatement yourself and get a ruling. Um, one of the things that you know I always caution employers on is, um, you get, you know, five different, uh, you get five different inspectors or auditors with um, with DOT on on a single job site, and they'll have five different opinions on you know basically how that program should be run and what is in or out of compliance. So anytime that you're trying to determine how to act on a certain thing, I always suggest going directly to drug abatement, either through your provider or directly, and getting um, and actually getting your guidance in writing so that later on if you're audited and um, that auditor says, oh, nope, nope, I disagree with that, then you've got in writing that you've actually gotten it from drug abatement that, that this is how you're supposed to proceed. Thank you. Is alcohol used in the workplace treated the same as drug testing? Yes. Um, you absolutely, employers absolutely have the right to treat drug testing the same as alcohol testing. Um, you, you know, obviously the, if you're talking about DOT, um, there's special requirements for how you do alcohol testing. Um, and that includes um, use, use, utilizing a, um, a EBT or evidential breath testing method. Um, employers also have the option for um, post-accident and reasonable suspicion to actually use either urine or um, oral swab based testing. Both options um, do allow you to add the component of alcohol to the test. Um, 
a lot of the oral swab, in fact, that's, that is actually a very standard component to a lot of the oral swab tests because so many employers do use those for post-accident and reasonable suspicion. So yes, alcohol is treated exactly the same. Um, if you have a zero tolerance policy that indicates you cannot be under the, the, um, the influence of alcohol while in the workplace, you absolutely have the right to test for it. Okay, um, this is actually going to be our last question, Cynthia. Our testing provider has told us that we can't use the saliva-based test as of yet because of the FDA hasn't give 510K clearance yet. Is that accurate? So that would depend on, can you repeat that question one more time because I think I might have missed something at the beginning of it. Sure. It says, our testing provider has told us that we can't use the saliva-based test yet because of the FDA hasn't given the five, 510K clearance yet. Is that accurate? I would have to look at the specific situation um, on where they're, where they're located, what they're utilizing the test for, and if there's any special, um, if there's any special circumstances to it. However, um, the FDA has approved um, has approved a couple of the oral swab kits. However, that actually occurred about five years ago, and really we've seen very little difference in the usage, and really nothing that has occurred, um, you know, in the courts in regards to um, utilizing an FDA approved test or using a non FDA approved test. And as I mentioned before, a lot of them. A lot of employers, what they're doing is they're actually using the um, oral swab test um, as a, you know, as a pretest, so to speak. You know, and if, if you if you're cleared on it, then you know you're fine, and nobody's going to argue that you've been cleared. Um, however, if you test if you test potentially positive, it's then being confirmed with a urine-based drug screen, which basically eliminates that whole entire. It basically eliminates any FDA question at that point. So um, again, I would need to look at the specific situation, and I'd be happy to do that if, if, um, if you know, the person would like to contact us at marketing and at AccusourceOnline.com. I would be happy to to speak with you individually and to learn the situ you know, learn your specific situation, and you know, give you some direction. Thank you, Cynthia. Again, a copy of this presentation will be available within 24 hours. If you would like a copy of the recorded presentation, please contact us at marketing at accusource-online.com and we'll be happy to provide that to you. Or please feel free to visit our resource section at www accusource online.com where you will find our webinar library. Thank you for joining us today and please feel free to contact us at marketing at accusource-online.com with any immediate questions or need for assistance. On behalf of the Accusource team, we wish you all a great day. Thank you.